Hmm. Have you guys ever realized that you just like being around people that are just like yourself? Is, am I the only one who ever feels that way? It's just so comforting to be around people who, who think like you, who um, maybe act like you, or same humor as you do, right? Like, it's, it's never fun to tell a joke and nobody laugh. Yeah. <laughs> See, one, I, I don't like the rest of you. Uh, <laughs> I have dull time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, here's the deal. Like, that's, that's human nature, right? We, we like being with people that are just like us. Uh, in fact, I went to Bolivia a couple years ago, about a year ago now, and it was awkward because, like, for one, I didn't know the language, and then some of the cultural stuff was just different. And, uh, I, again, it wasn't like it was a terrible time, but I didn't, I couldn't enjoy my company, right? Because I couldn't s- talk Spanish, speak Spanish, I didn't even speak English, hardly. <laughs> um, and so, it, you know, there's some of that that happens. Um, and so, yeah, anyways, we like to be around people that are just like us, whether it be humor, whether it be dress, whether it be uh, maybe even age or um, socioeconomic stage of life. We just, you know, it's just it's normal, right? Right? It's normal, you know, so, so many people who are in their 20s don't just call up, you know, somebody in their, their 70s, like, hey, let's go hang this weekend, let's go, I want to go play some bocce, you know, let's go shuffleboarding together, because uh, I'm 20 or 80, we've got some, got some things we can do together this weekend, you know, i got, got some concert tickets to Kenny G, we just go hang, you know, it just doesn't, right, I mean, it doesn't, unless it's your grandma, and then maybe that's really sweet of you, right, and you're like, oh, I'm taking grandma Kenny G, that's so cool, if you don't know who Kenny G is, don't worry about it. Um, just aged to myself. So we do that, and we also do the other thing, right? Where, where people who aren't like us, we, uh, we maybe gang up on them together with people that are like us, uniting on the fact that we don't like those people that aren't like us, right? Um, you see this with countries, right? So, so like, I, I was listening to stuff on World War I, and, and, and uh, some people were like, well, how did World War I start? I'm like, Germany and France just didn't like each other. Oh, like, that's it. I mean, there really wasn't anything super complicated um, about it, other than they're like, oh, we don't like those guys. I mean, there's other things, right, that were compounding, but two nations, both white, Anglo-ish people who had similar, you know, they're all Christian-ish nations, and yet they just didn't like each other because there's some differences. Different languages, different cultures, different things, and, uh, and so, you know, why not kill a few million people over it? And, and that's kind of how the world works, right? That's how the world keeps spinning, you know, ISIS versus other Islamic people over in Iraq. I mean, that's just the way it rolls. Something. And, and that's just the nature of humans, right? We unite even against people we don't get along with, or we don't like, we don't know, we don't understand, and, and it happens in the church. Can you believe it? In the church? No. You don't say, Pastor. <laughs> yes, even in the church. So, we do this. Differences to d- divide. Human condition. We, we don't like things that are different sometimes. Um, and if we're going to be honest, we, we, we even deal with this in our families, you know, in our, in, our, in our relationships at work. I mean, there's certain people we like to stay away from, certain people. And again, it's, it's natural. I'm not trying to say, oh, you jerks out there, I'm so much better than you. Like, I'm the same way, <laughs> right? Uh, we just flow that way. And so, um, it, everywhere, right? I mean, if you look at the news today, you even can see this everywhere. Like, it's just people who have differences that don't get along. So in Ferguson, right, Missouri? Everybody see the news? You got some oppressed African Americans who who the, the police are trying to do their job, and you got people on both sides on Facebook lighting things up, like, oh, these guys over there, and they're like, oh no, they're the police officers. And it's like, hold on a second, like, there's again, I just some of you guys are like, hold on a second, is he going there? Right? And I'm not taking a side. What I'm saying is that people of difference tend to not get along. And so in today's text, in the book of Ephesians, we actually see um, we see two groups within the church, right? There's Jewish people and there's Gentile people. And historically in the church, they don't get along. It's actually some of the biggest fights that go down in the church are because of these differences. Differences that divide. And yet, Paul's going to step in and say, hey, actually, you guys should be the most united people on the planet because there's some things that tie you together that are so much deeper than the stuff that's dividing you. And so, um, we're going to look at that today. I'm going to read through Ephesians uh, and, and take, a, take a, a gander at what Paul says about this um, yeah. Hmm. So before we get into that, let me pray. Uh, we're going to find ourselves in Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 11. Jesus, we thank you tonight for your awesome word um, that we get to uh, enjoy tonight because you've provided it for us. We thank you that, um, 
that your truth isn't hidden from us, that we don't have to walk around guessing what you think because what you think and what you feel and what you want us to know is right in front of us at our fingertips in your Bible. And we just thank you for that truth um, that even tonight can transform some of our hearts that have become calloused against uh, things and that you could free us to live lives before you uh, of peace and understanding and love um, because only you can do that to even hard hearts like our own. Amen. Many of you may even have heard, uh, I, I, I sometimes tell a story because it's just so profound to me, uh, people in kind of this generation coming up, I think I was probably towards the tail end of some of the stuff that was happening in the Cincinnati area, it doesn't happen so much anymore, I'd be all over the national news, it would happen now, um, but we used to have the Klan used to march on Fountain Square, downtown Cincinnati, every Christmas and put a white cross on Fountain Square. And uh, one of those Klansmen, I think some of you may recall me telling you this story before, was my sister's boyfriend in high school. And um, my parents weren't hardly home. I don't know what kind of home you grew up in, but my parents were probably there. Not much of the time. They both worked jobs, and then they had hobbies. And, and so there were many evenings left alone to uh, six children running amok in the house, and I was the youngest of all of them. And, uh, and Chuck DeVore would come over, and uh, he would teach me about the Klan, about how I should hate Jews and blacks, and how uh, Hitler was really an awesome guy, actually, and misunderstood. And he would teach this to me uh, these evenings after hanging out with my sister and, uh, and told me, hey, I'm gonna, we're going to march on Fountain Square together, Jimmy. And all of a sudden, I, 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 I remember being influenced by him. Back, I think it was five. So it was, it was my son, Ethan. And, uh, gosh. and I remember feeling, oh, this guy's paying attention to me. He, he likes me, which is <coughs> awful. Um, that's actually how a lot of cults start. You get a really nice guy to kind of lead a group. And I think that guy likes me. I'm going to follow. I don't care. <laughs> you know? um, but the other part was, was I enjoyed seeing myself superior to others, thinking that I was somehow better than other people around me because I was in a poor home in the middle of a middle-class community that, that I really was kind of like at the bottom of like the scale when it came to my peers around me, even in my neighborhood. So to feel like, oh, yeah, I can feel superior. I remember the, the lure of that. And so we do the same thing, don't we? Like in our hearts sometimes. Obviously, Chuck uh, got found out by my parents, and actually he ended up in jail. Imagine that. What a winner. Um, and my parents found out some of his influence. We had long talks over that. And, uh, and uh, honestly, I actually, um, now I have two adopted African-American children. Um, I actually, even in high school, my community, I didn't see a single African-American until I was 16 years old. Because <laughs> my, my community was so entrenched with some of that influence. It was awful. And so throughout history, we see in different cultures, in different countries, these sort of divisions. And even in the church, we see these divisions. Black churches, white churches, rich churches, poor churches, indie rock churches, and folk churches. <laughs> and yet, that's not the will of God. And so, um, yeah, he's going to wade right into this. And, and, and something that we're not even going to understand, actually, because we don't have the, the language of Jew versus Gentile in our culture. We don't even... I don't even know if anybody, anybody here knows a Jewish person. My first Jewish experience was when I was 21, and some guy made me matzo ball soup. It was delicious. Mm. It was delicious. It was awesome. And uh, Gentiles, basically anybody who's not Jew, according to the Jewish people. And so there's, this is the disruption right at the beginning of the church. And what happened, basically, was this idea that Jesus came to the Jewish nation, and he was a Jew himself. And he came out of the line of Abraham and Isaac and the Old Testament that we see here. These are the God's chosen people. There's a, there's a guy named Abraham, and he was the father. He had many sons. I'm not even going there. There's an old school song that's really obnoxious, and it just started over here. And we'll just swarm around it. Even start going. It's really, if you weren't in Protestant Sunday school, you have no clue what's going on right now. And that is good. Anyway, so, um, so anyways, Abraham... Father of the nation, God appears to him and he looks up at the stars and God says, I, you're going to have so many kids, it's going to outnumber these stars. And it's not like in the city where you see like 12 stars. It's like in the middle of nowhere with no lights, right? There's millions of them out there. And, uh, and he says, you're going to have so many children. I'm going to bless you and make you father of, of a nation, you know. And out of him, all the Jews trace their lineage. He is, he's like the granddad at the top of the, the family tree. And, and what God meant through that as we get further revelation from Jesus is that He's going to bless the nations through Abraham's seed, and, and that will then make so many more people that are children of Abraham outside of the Jewish nation. 
So through faith in Christ then, people who aren't Jewish by lineage or by birth or, or aren't born into the nation of Israel now become children of God. Because faith in Christ unites them to the covenant promises of Abraham. So all of us who are Christians sitting in this room today can say that Abraham actually is our father in some ways. Because God made a covenant with him, a promise with him that said, Abraham, through you I'm going to build a nation and from that nation I'm going to bless all the nations of the world. I'm going to bring them to me. And so now today you see people in Africa and China and Japan and even Canada all worshiping Jesus, <laughs> right? Well, you worship anything when it's that cold. Here it comes, right? I mean, so that's what it is. All over the whole world now, South America, North America, Central America, all over Africa. Uh, Ten years ago, the, the most condensed growth in the church was, uh, was Africa. Now it's moved to China. So millions and millions and millions of people calling themselves Christians, and they're like, yeah, actually, Abraham, that Jewish guy, I trace my lineage to him spiritually. And so that's, that's the difference here. But what happened right when Christianity was birthed, and all these people were like, hey, we're in the family, the Jews were like, I, hmm, yeah, I don't know about this. Who's all these, that girl was just a prostitute last week, and now she's in our church. Yikes, because the Jewish nation wasn't all about that. They weren't all about that. They had rules, they had regulations, they had things they followed as a culture that kept them separate. It was part of their culture. Things like hand washing, like before they ate, like was a big deal. One time Jesus shows up to a party and he's like, doesn't wash his hands. And some guy's like, you didn't wash your hands? <laughs> and he's like, guess what? And he, Jesus is always so like quirky. He goes, well, you guys, you know, you wash the outside of your dishes, but guess what? The inside of your dish is just full of nasty and he was talking about sin in their life. Like, even though you guys have these cultures that separate you, basically, is what Jesus was saying, the inside of yourself needs some help. And I'm here for that. I'm not about all about the washing of the hands, because that's just an outside thing. And so, so many things tie into this, like dietary restrictions and things that kept them separate. Ways that they dressed, ways that they ate, ways that they communicated. Like, just all sorts of things that kept them separate, that were actually there for a reason. That God actually gave them to them so they'd be a separate nation. So they won't just be absorbed into the rest of the nations of the world. But when God says, Jesus is coming, now I'm accepting a lot of other people into this family. He's like, and these laws that used to hold on to, they don't matter anymore. We're opening it up. So all of these things, all these regulations, all these ways to dress. And could you imagine some of those Jewish people who are like, yeah, this is how it's been for generations. And so now there's another, other cultures that we're to be working with. It was really hard. And some of them, and this is where it comes down to some of the religious stuff, some of them actually felt like by dressing a certain way, by eating a certain way, by drinking a certain way, that God liked them somehow more than others. Does that sound familiar? People inside the church today are like, well, the, those people out there, man, they, you see the way they dress? Not like us people in the church who, who haven't changed our style since the 80s. <laughs> Sorry, I had to take the shot. I did. I did. I had to go there. And, and yet... And yet, you know, one time, one time this lady once said to me, she's like, I would never have a pastor that was not wearing a tie and a jacket. I cannot believe what you wear to preach in. Honestly. But that's Christians on Christians. But Christians on non-Christians, I mean, they just shoot at everybody sometimes from the church because of the way they act, the way they dress, and all these things. And when they come and join their church, they're like, oh, wow, you're different. Huh. And so this is our problem. I haven't even read scripture yet, but this is the problem we're walking into right now. I just want to set the stage, set the feel, because a lot of you are walking in here today and you feel like you don't somehow fit into God's family because you're a little different than the people you know that are church people. But here tonight, we're, 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 we're going to rethink what actually church means, and hopefully, hopefully you understand that you actually fit regardless of what you're bringing today. Regardless of what culture you're bringing in here, what differences you may have, what sin you may be troubled with, because that's a whole other thing that you're welcome into God's family, not based off of all these extra things that sometimes Christians put on people, but based solely on Jesus and how he accepts you. And so let's walk in. We're in Ephesians 2 again. Verse 11 through 12 is where we're going to start. If you don't have a Bible, there's some in your pew I threw there. Um, they're yours to take home with you if you don't have any. Um, yeah. So yeah. Anyway, so here we go. I'm going to read a couple verses, and then we'll, we'll, we'll chew, and then I'll keep kind of going for a few verses. All right, so right here. <clears throat> oh, wrong book. That would be fun. There we go, there's Ephesians. It says, therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision. All right, before you get too confused, let me just, 
I'm, I'm going to talk about it for a second, then I'm not going to touch it again because it's really gross. So they were called the uncircumcision because a circumcised male is one who has the foreskin of his <clears throat> cut off, and so he's circumcised. And a lot of people didn't do that back then unless they were Jewish. It was a way that they identified themselves from other nations. Again, it was a mark, a really painful one. And, and they, uh, now it's cultural, it's not a big deal, but back then only Jewish people did it, nobody else did. And it was a mark. And so that was one of the things that they called people that weren't Jewish with the uncircumcised, the ones that didn't have the foreskin of their cut. And uh, I don't even know how they checked, but that's okay, we won't go there, that's all we're going to talk about that. But it was kind of a, it was a trash-talking way to talk to people that weren't Jewish. You uncircumcised. It's kind of gross if you think about it, but um, yeah, so... Let me keep reading. Therefore, called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, so you're being called this by the Jewish people, which is made with, in the flesh by hand, so he's, he's tipping the hat to, but they do this just with their hands, it's nothing spiritual about it. Remember that you, at that time, were separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, stranger to the covenants of promises, having no hope, and without God in the world. So the first thing he says is therefore, and there's this little cheesy little saying that if you're ever reading scripture, you always ask yourselves this question, what is the therefore, therefore, <laughs> yeah, cheesy, right? But what's the therefore, therefore? He's, he's tapping into what we just went through last week, which is this, this amazing idea that by grace we're saved through faith, this is not of ourselves, it's a free gift from God. And right before that he actually says that you guys were dead in your trespasses and sins and, and Jesus shows up. And decides he's going to make you alive. Even though you were broken, even though you were, you, were, you, were, you were lost, you were blind, you couldn't see God. Jesus came, he died. And through faith in him, God will make you alive. Pretty amazing, right? That your sin separated you from God so drastically that he had to send his own son to bear the penalty and the wrath, it says in Ephesians 2. The wrath that was destined for you got placed on his son Jesus through faith in Jesus. Crazy simple, but amazingly powerful that once we had cold hearts towards God and he spoke life, like he spoke life into this world, to our hearts and made us love him, made us change. And so he says, remember that. And he goes, therefore, okay, so coming off of that, remember, remember, okay, so he's like, okay, so you guys remember when you didn't know Jesus. That's how he's going to start, basically. Remember when you guys were like really far off the path? You had no clue about God. You had no clue about a relationship with his family. You were stranger to these, strangers to these covenants that he made in the Old Testament with people like Abraham and Isaac and all those guys. You didn't have a clue about them. And even, even so, he's, he's going through the list. You were, you were alienated from God's family, Israel. You were strangers to the covenants that you were, you were it says here, without hope. So there's a guy I was listening to on a, um, on a podcast the other day. I listened to uh, some guy called the Tim Ferriss Show. It's, it's whatever. It's kind of nerdy, businessy stuff. And I uh, just like it. So anyways, don't judge me. Um, but Tim Ferriss is non-Christian. Real smart dude. Uh, interviews all sorts of guys from uh, like Wired Magazine to just like billion dollar dudes. And just interviews them, asking them a bunch of questions. I find it totally interesting. But one day he had a guy on there that I think, I think he was like a CrossFit guy. He was a Christian. Is that, is that somebody? Probably. Yeah. Anyways, and so, he's a CrossFit guy here, so, and, and he was interviewing, and he kind of wades in, it's weird, like, Tim Ferriss, like, it, he just doesn't pull any punches, and he goes, he just goes, so, listen, I hear you're a Christian, and, uh, and I've been thinking about death a lot lately. This is a dude who just typically is, like, just straight up the middle, kind of Buddhist background type of guy. He's like, and I've been th thinking about death a lot lately, and I, I just, I'm not so sure what's going to happen when I die. What do Christians think? Just like total like softball. Like, there you go, with a wiffle bat. Like, and, and the dude on the other side says, well, I just, I don't, I don't really talk about that sort of thing, you know, because people can think whatever they want. I think a certain way, but think, and like, it's just like this like total like dog chasing his tail, sort of like two minutes, and then he changed the subject. And I'm like, oh, huh. it was like a softball. It was awesome. Tim Ferriss is like, I don't have any hope. Death is coming. You tell me, Christian, what do you think? Without hope. So a guy with literally millions of dollars, Tim Ferriss, interviews billionaires on the radio, goes, when I die, I have no clue what's going to happen. What do you guys think in the Christian church? And the Christian, because he's like, I don't have any hope, and the other guy's like, I don't know. We're tempted to do that sometimes, right? I mean, it's just a thing. I mean, like, I used to get super uncomfortable 
Like right when I became a Christian, when I was around my non-Christian friends, and you, you have that like Christian friend who's like totally like, kind of like Ned Flanders weird sort of Christian who just like carries his Bible around. I carried my Bible around, but like it's super aggressive sort of like, you know, talk for two minutes about something like, so when you die, do you think you're going to go to heaven or hell? Like, ah, uh, we were just eating pancakes. Now I feel awkward. Um, and, and, and yet, you know, I, I talk to people about Jesus, right? It's, it's all right. But like that used to, like when I first got to be a Christian, totally made me uncomfortable. So I'm not slamming that guy at all who, who punted the softball, um, which doesn't make, that illustration makes no sense. So sorry. Um, sorry about that. So the idea though is this, is that there's no hope. He's like, remember when you didn't have hope? Remember when you were without God, for real. Like, they had gods, right? The Ephesian church, they had gods they worshipped, like Artemis and these other things that aren't really gods. They were very magical people. They had spells and all these things that they did as a church. And we see, uh, actually, in Acts 19, that they burn them all together um, as a church. They have this big old bonfire with about $60 million worth of, like, magical books. And he's like, you used to worship wrong gods. Now you know the living God. Now you know the one true God. And you're known by him. And you no longer don't have hope, but now you have hope. See, there's a powerful thing. I think we need to not skip this. Because some people think in the church like, okay, so once you teach people about Jesus, then you move away from that and you just teach them what to do now. Like somehow the Christian faith for some people in some churches, a lot of churches, say, okay, so I'm going to tell you about Jesus and about how you're broken without him. But once you believe in that, you don't have to think about that ever again. Now you get to think about all the good stuff you can do with your life for God. And I'm going to even make you feel bad about not doing it on a regular basis as a church. But what God says a lot through scripture is like, okay, once you become a Christian, it is vital that you remember what you were like without Jesus because you will forget. You will leak out the understanding that you actually aren't as good as you think you are. You were a broken mess back there and God picked you up out of that crap hole that you found yourself in. And even today, your heart drifts there. Remember, remember. So, so as a constant avenue with ourselves so we don't rise above whatever standard we have in our brain. Like, we got to constantly bring ourselves back to remember your brokenness. Remember your brokenness. Uh, Jimmy and I were talking this week, Domer over here, we were talking about, I forget, there's some ancient smart dude that once said, was it Luther, who said, to grow in the Christian faith is to constantly return to the beginning. A constant remembrance of the beginning. It's so important that we see Jesus for who he is and see us for who we are. So he's about to get into something here with them. He's like, remember when you were separated, you were dead and you were apart. Remember, do you guys remember that? Can you, can you feel that? Sometimes God makes me remember that so much that literally I will cry. Literally I will feel warm tears rolling down my face because I will remember what it felt like to be apart from God. What it felt like to be lost, what it felt like to worship myself all the time and not even know him, and that he's revealed himself to me through his son Jesus in such a clear and present way that even inside of myself, I feel an echoing of like, I'm his. The Bible calls that the Holy Spirit. It says that we, it attests inside of us that we're children of God. And so I remember that, and then I feel that, and it just overwhelms me. Um, yeah. Yeah. We should be shaken by that remembrance at times. Not all the time, obviously, but I think it's a powerful thing. And so he, he, he lays it up that way. And most churches don't want to stay there. They, don't, they want to move past it, like I said. They don't want to stay there. But it's powerful for change to remember who we are and who God is. Right? Right. So he then moves on. After he reminds them who they once were, he says, but, which is a, Amazing statement. <laughs> but now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So you were way out because Jesus bled for you, bled the blood that you should bleed for your own sin. Through the blood of Christ, he brought you close. And he says, for he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. You see, like, in the Old Testament, there was this thing called the temple, right? And the temple was a place that was constructed to worship God, much like a church, but way more important. <laughs> way more important. I mean, our churches today, I mean, they're not, they're, 
They're not supposed to be like the temple. The temple was a place where people made blood sacrifices for their sins, where God's presence, special presence was supposed to be. And people went there as Jews to worship God from all over the Roman Empire. And there was a wall, actually, that's, that, was, that surrounded it. It was called the dividing wall. And on the one side, it was what's was called the Gentile court. So Gentiles that were Jewish kind of converted to Jews, Judaism. They would go hang out in the Gentile court. But they couldn't go inside this dividing wall. And they're actually, they, were, they found a stone from the temple that was unearthed, I think about 30 years ago. And on the stone is a giant engraved, like four foot stone that says, those who choose to pass this wall, if they are not Jewish, have chosen for themselves the penalty of death. Like basically, if you're a Gentile and you go in there, you're dead. You're, a, you're dead meat. You cannot enter into our space. Talk about a wall, right? That makes the Berlin Wall look crazy. Sorry, aging myself again. 80s Cold War, Russia, Rocky movies. Check it out sometime. Um, and Rambo, right? Cold War era. Sorry, random. And the dividing wall, though, he says, has been torn down. Wow. It's gone. <laughs> it's sharp. It's no longer there. There's no longer a dividing wall between you guys. And there's also... It's a double thing here. He says, basically, the blood of Christ has drawn you close to God and has drawn you close to each other now. That it's gone. So he opens this up to start. But first he, he leads with God. That you were drawn near by the blood of Christ. You see, peace, right? It's such a weird word that people just throw around today. Peace, like to have peace, right? People define it as things like to look past your differences and just coexist, right? And to just kind of like accept people where they are and just kind of, you know, just kind of like Sesame Street episodes where everybody's singing at the end, you know. And again, like I don't, I'm going to sound really negative and like a complete jerk here in a second. So <clears throat> well, I, can, I can do that sometimes because I think the Bible kind of lays things up in, in ways that maybe press us culturally. They're different. See, peace is not just like kind of coexisting with people. Peace is absolute harmony. It's united under the same stuff. The same unity. You know, even as I was like looking up like quotes from famous people on peace, like none of them agreed what it actually meant. That, so you'd have some peace quotes that just wouldn't make sense with each other. Like you'd have a guy uh, who say something like, well, peace is, is absence of fighting. And then you'd have another guy be like, peace is not absence of fighting. Peace is, is fighting for peace. Like, what? That was Albert Einstein. Like he's so smart, but that made no sense. <laughs> We're going to fight for peace and have peace because we fought for peace. Like, what side are you fighting for to have peace? Like, you just draw the logical conclusions out of all these, like, pithy sayings, and they mean nothing, right? The absence of violence is not peace because how much of a marriage would that be if I, my wife and I just didn't fight? Oh, we, we have such a peaceful home. We never talk. We never communicate. I never kiss her. At least we don't fight. Right? You're like, oh, that's such a peaceful home. Wonderful. There's no fighting. There's no love. There's no unity. There's no like, we're married and we love each other. And we do, desperately. So I call our home peaceful in that. That doesn't mean we don't have our quibbles from time to time. Quibbles is a cool British word I stole. And yet, <laughs> it's a cool word, isn't it? And yet, the peace that we have is united under a lot of bigger things than just lack of violence or overlooking just your, I'm just going to overlook your bad stuff. Like, I'm accepting you with all of it. All of it. And so, yeah, we can go deeper into that, that philosophical question, what is peace? But here's the deal. God is going to say, you guys are going to have peace and it's going to look like being brought near. It's going to, instead of having a, because whenever you have, uh, like, hostility with somebody, whether it be a friend or relative or anything, distance is always there, right? It could be physical distance, right? You don't want to be around that person. It could be emotional distance. So even if they're close to you, you act like they're dead. <laughs> oh, no. Right? <laughs> yeah. And so this, the, the, it's always a distance of something. It's a distance physically. It's a distance emotionally. It's, it's some sort of distance. So if there's hostility and there's no peace, you know it's not, you know you don't have peace with a person when there's some level of distance. And so what he says is what God does through the blood of Jesus is he brings you near. You were far. You couldn't get to him. There was a giant chasm separating you. He wasn't talking to you. You weren't talking to him. There was, now there's closeness. And then he goes, and this wall that used to stand in the temple, man, it's gone. 
And actually, at the time where he's writing this, that, that wall still existed. The physical wall still existed. It wasn't torn down yet. But he said, spiritually speaking, that wall's gone. The wall is gone between you guys. And why? Because you're united by something of greater magnitude. You actually are united by something way larger than you even know. And then he goes into that a little bit. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh that dividing wall of hostility. By abolishing, this is the first thing he does, and I kind of already kicked this off, by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in the ordinances. Okay, he's talking about Old Testament, like, like laws of like purity, all right, where you're not around, not allowed being around. Uh, I have a couple of these here. It's pretty interesting, some of the stuff that they weren't allowed to do. Huh. Oh, yeah. Whew. So if um, there were like certain rules about not entering into a Gentile's house, or else you'd be unclean. Happy would that make you feel if you had a friend like, oh, you, you can't come in. Or, no, I can't come in your house. Well, why? I got, I got some stuff going. Yeah. Got some porks, pork skewers over there, which they won't have to do that either. Like, no, I can't do it. Well, why? Because if I go in your place, psh, I'll be unclean. Sorry. No offense. You're unclean and uncircumcised. And I can't eat your pork because I'm not allowed to do that either. either. And so he said he broke down the, even those laws and ordinances. So they're allowed to hang at each other's houses now. One time there's a guy named Peter and he was sitting on a roof and this, this, like he has a vision from God of like a big sheet dropping from heaven with all of this delicious food on it. Like pigs. Like how sad is it to be to be Jewish and not be able to eat bacon? Can we just reflect on that for a second and have a spiritual experience with, together? I mean, seriously, how good it is to be a Christian and eat bacon now. You couldn't eat that if you were a Jew. You couldn't eat bacon, you couldn't eat pork, you couldn't eat pork rinds, you couldn't eat barbecue. Anyway, so they, there's all this stuff they couldn't eat. And the, the, the sheet came down, and, and God goes, kill and eat, Peter. Kill and eat. And uh, the, the, the symbol was basically all this stuff that was now separating you, all these dietary laws, all of these other things. Man, they're now gone. They were meant to separate you guys so that you guys would stay distinct people. Now you all, all are a different people, brought together by more than just purity rights, quote, unquote. And so, yeah, that's what happened. He said that God has destroyed that. That's what he did first. So he got rid of kind of your cultural differences. So those aren't important anymore. Whether or not, not somebody eats like a certain type of food, culturally speaking, shouldn't divide anymore. And then it says, he made one new man in place of two. So making peace. So that's his definition of peace. Being drawn close and being united as one same type of individual. We're going to look at three different examples here in a second on how he does that. And he says this, <clears throat> and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. So he's going to kill the hostility by making us one body, by uniting us together. And he came and preached peace to those who were far off. So he's talking about the Gentiles again. And peace to those who are near, talking about the Jews. So he's like, he preached peace everywhere. Peace between them and God through the blood of Jesus and peace amongst each other. No longer Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male or female, but all are one in Christ, it says in Galatians. That there's no more gender sort of like hierarchy at the foot of the cross. Level. Gentile Jew. Same. Slave or free? Because there's a lot of slaves in the Roman Empire. You would even sell yourself into slavery in order to get out from under debt. It was, a, it was, a, it was an interesting culture. And they were seen as Way down there on the, slave or free, you guys are all on the same playing field. So that means actually in the church at the time, if you were a slave, you could be the pastor of the church and your master could be out there listening to you preach on Sunday. And that's the way the church was supposed to work. There's a level playing field now that we're all one in Christ. We're no longer separated by these things that culture says delineates your value and worth and status. All are one in Christ. Level playing field for everybody at the foot of the cross. That you're all equally separated by your sin and you're all equally loved by the God who provides the sacrifice. That's powerful stuff there. So he came and preached peace to those who are far off and peace that are near. And God says basically, like, if we're going to take this now, Jesus didn't really go preach to the Gentiles. He sent people to preach. So Jesus is preaching even today through his church peace between God 
and between each other. And quite frankly, I think that the church isn't preaching to each other very well. And we'll talk about that in a second. It says this, For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. There are multiple spirits. It's not multiple Holy Spirits coming down from God uniting us to him. The Holy Spirit, it says in the Bible, like it regenerates our hearts. It brings us to God. The Holy Spirit helps us to pray. It, it unites us together. This Holy Spirit is a bond that holds the church together, that every single person who's a believer in Christ, it says it has an indwelling of this Holy Spirit. We've already seen that in Ephesians. And it says all of us in one spirit, not a spirit given to Asians, not a spirit given to the rich people, not a different spirit given to the poor people. Or the, it's all the same. Same exact God, same exact spirit, same exact Jesus, same exact sin that separates you. And so he says this, through one spirit we have access. And then he bridges this, man, it's beautiful, awesome, rich, okay? Revolutionary, in kind of the way it does this thing. He says this, so you are no longer... Strangers and aliens. Aliens is, is like a sojourner. It's somebody who lives in the country. Kind of like uh, uh, somebody who's from Mexico, living in Texas, who doesn't have citizenship for this country. It's kind of like an alien, right? They're, they call them illegal aliens, if you don't know that. It's not our culture, necessarily. If we lived in Texas, we'd probably be talking about it a lot. Some of you would be getting very angry that I even brought it up, because it's that much of a hot-button issue, right? But he says, you are aliens, culturally speaking. You're no longer strangers and aliens anymore. He's talking about in God's economy. But you are fellow citizens with the saints. Members of God's household built upon a, the foundation of the prophets and the apostles, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place by the Spirit. So three things he, he compares our unity after he just kind of blasted through some of that stuff. He says, first, you're citizens. All right. <laughs> you're citizens. I mean, I think some of the, the biggest things, man, in, in this world are because the citizens from other countries, man, just go against each other. Even in America, when, when America was first founded, you know, I don't know if you sat in high school history class, like, oh, America's this melting pot, you know, all these cultures, such a beautiful place. Like, America, traditionally, even as all of these people were coming over, like, it didn't get along. Have you ever seen the movie called Gangs of New York, Leonardo DiCaprio? Yeah, it's a bloody movie. It's pretty awful. But basically, the, the Irish men were fighting the like native Anglos. The Irish people were kind of being imported into the United States and New York. There's these bloody battles happening, happening at the five points. You have all of this. So even, it was, it was a lot of white-on-white -white violence back at that time and stage. It was against the Polish, it was against the Irish, against the Germans, against the Italians, because they're all descending upon the same country, fighting for their spots. And so even in places like in Northeast Ohio, Ravenna was highly populated by Italians. And they lived in their own neighborhood in this town and didn't intermingle. They're all Catholics too, by the way. The Italian Catholic uh, town here. It's kind of founded. A lot of the people here were Italians and Catholics. And then other people from different, like, places kind of filled in around them here. It's like that all over Northeast Ohio. If you go to Cleveland, they actually still have Polish town. It's got some delicious pickles. I'm dead serious, like imported Polish pickles are amazing. Um, sorry, I got Polish-Hungarian blood, and so my mom always like, let's go get some pickles. Um, so we would go up there and get some pickles. She talks just like that, too. It's a cute little Polish lady, my mom. You listen to this, mom, I love you. Anyway, so, um, and that was, um, that's, that's how our world works, right? That we have all of this citizenship that we're divided into, we're divided into countries, and, 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 and even as that's happening, we still have a lot of fighting. And even in our own country, like, like you get the feeling like some people are like our Americans, but some people are like our Americans, right? Like they have like the flag in their yard. I'm not, like, I'm not trashing, like being patriotic. Like I, I can listen to a good John Williams piece I don't know that is again. And, and have tears in my eyes because I'm proud to be an American. You know, and it's, it's beautiful. I love patriotism. But I think sometimes people become so entrenched with who they are as citizens of their country that God comes in and says, actually, your higher calling is a citizen of my country. That's actually never going to die. Like, America's pretty young. It's probably going to pass before this world passes. Hate to say that. But the way countries rise and fall, like, America maybe doesn't have a permanent shelf life for the rest of eternity. 
at least until Jesus comes back. But here's the deal. God's citizenship, I mean, everybody at this point were Romans. How many people are Romans today? None, <laughs> right? God's citizenship is eternal. It's above all things. It exists in all things. He says, you guys are united as citizens of my real and palpable eternal kingdom through Jesus. That just like there are anthems and ways of life as citizens of a country, as citizens of my country being everywhere, you're now united. More so than any other country. More so than any other sort of patriotism you could ever have for a country. We are to be united under the understanding that God has united us as citizens of his country. That's pretty awesome stuff. And then he goes and says, you're his family. So whether your family was good or bad, you know, these are the tightest bonds we could ever have, are his family. Like my family was a little bit junky at times, honestly. And yet if, if like my dad went into the hospital, like, and I got a call like in an hour from now, you better bet I'd be driving down four and a half hours to Cincinnati. Even though we only talk a few times a year now. Because it's a tight bond, family. I got six siblings, and we live all over the country. But you better bet if one of their kids got sick or something, I might be flying out to see them because family is tight. Family is close. I mean, I was at soccer practice the other day. I'm a soccer coach. And I have two brothers on my team. One's a little older than younger. You know how brothers fight. I mean, if you've had a brother, you know how it goes. One of them had a water bottle, and the other one, like, I want the water bottle. And the other one's, no. You know, and just like, whoa, these kids are really cool. And, and so they made sure they both got a drink of water. I mean, you're talking about five and six-year-old. You know, we're young, right? Actually, no, it's four and five-year-old. And so we're, we're pretty young, right? My kids are that age. Just, oh, give me the water, give me the water. And the brothers, right? So, okay, well, okay. We settled that. And then we're out playing. And one of the kids on my team, who's not related, goes and pushes one of the kids. The other kid takes him out. I mean, he's like, you just touched my brother! Wham! And I'm like, whoa! Ah! What just happened? He just went MMA on the kid. Like, they were just fighting. But you touch his brother, you're going to pay. Right? That's just how it works. That's just the way it works. Somebody tried, I had a cut little, this happened yesterday, actually. I had a, there was a little girl who was, uh, who, who's cousins of my kids, and she was just being hyper and, and whatever, and she reached up and hit me in the shirt. <laughs> my son gets between, like my five-year-old son gets between us, like, you don't touch my dad. Like, you're going to do anything. Like, I'm a big dude, and this girl's like six, and you're five, and like, you just don't do it. You know, like, like he's, he's standing off. Like, I couldn't protect myself from a six-year-old girl. Thanks, Ethan. But um, <laughs> he's going to stand up and make sure daddy's protected, um, I guess. And, and yet... I'm just going to be really honest with you on something because this sounds really like kind of pie in the sky, unicorn on the horizon, like, oh, guys, we're all family, we're Christians, blah, 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 blah. Let's act like it. woo um, That's really not helpful, um, honestly. Because here's the thing. Like, even though we are family, God says we're family, we don't always feel like it as a church uh, because, quite frankly, the church doesn't exist like a family typically. It's typically like, hey, come on in and we'll talk to you about Jesus from a pulpit or something, and then you kind of go live your life, and nobody cares about you, we're not going to care about you, and you don't care about each other, and we don't kind of reach into your life. Or you come in, and you're like, well, the church has to fulfill my menu of needs, and I'm going to leave, and uh, you know, if they don't fulfill my menu of needs, I'm gone. It's like, how, how many families actually work like that? And we treat each other that way, we expect our church experience to be that way. It's so much of a mess. And God knows the mess. Um, I have two adopted kids, right? And this pains me to tell you guys this, but, but there have been times... Um, and I didn't know it was going to be this way, honestly. I, there have been times where I didn't love my adopted children like I loved my biological son. Like, I knew it in my heart. Like, I couldn't, I couldn't understand what was happening in my heart, like why I was not having the same sort of love and compassion and desire for my adopted children as I did for my, my biological son. If anybody here has, has adopted children, or you, may, you might be tracking with me a little bit. I don't know what that is. Other than my heart's fallen and it's broken, and for whatever reason my heart just is broken there. And so I've prayed so many different times to be like, God, can you just help my heart to love the children that are mine? I have my last name now? And I think in some, some senses, like the church feels that way to many of us. We feel like we're kind of like adopted kids that nobody cares about. And yet 
we treat each other that way too. And, and, and I'm just, I'm just going to say this, that God has for his church a family. And that family isn't always going to be perfect. It isn't only, always going to love each other well. But um, in, in one sense, um, he says that you are a family. And I've made you as a family so that you can exist together and care for each other like a family. And so that's why you see in the, the New Testament, you got people like that are coming over each other's houses. They're sharing their food. When somebody has a need, they're filling it. When, you know, and they're breaking the bread of Jesus together and, they're, and at, at where they're going. And they're, they're gathering around the scriptures together. That they're doing all of these things together. That it says, <laughs> in some ways, this is just some of the stuff that it says that the church as a family does together. That they're going to be at peace together. That they're to love each other. That they're to be devoted to each other. That they're honor one another above themselves. Accept one another. Teach, greet, serve. Carry burdens. Be patient. Confess their sins. Forgive each other. Pray with each other. Live in harmony. I mean, these... These are, these are actions of a family I think many of us have never seen the church actually do. Because uh, it's hard. And we like to isolate ourselves. Because um, we live in a very isolated culture where like our closest friend is a, is a text away. But they, they don't ever come other than in texts. You know? You know what I mean? We, we don't have warm bodies. We don't have closeness as much as maybe we, we can. And so we live in isolation um, I have lived in isolation a lot in my life as a Christian. And yet the most helpful way that God has organized his church is to say, hey, you guys are for each other. You're a family. By the blood of Jesus, I've made you a family. And you're, you, through my spirit, can, can walk with each other and help each other. And yet you shut each other down and shut each other out. And you'll live in isolation. And that's going to hurt yourself. It's going to hurt the church. Like the church, it says, is a body. It's a community. It's a nation. It's a family. And so many people try to figure out this thing called discipleship through like books and programs, but if we just got the family piece down of how to grow with Christ as a family, I think that we would be closer to God's heart for us as his people. And so um, I'll just make a quick thought for you. So one of the ways you might be thinking like, well, how do you guys, how do you guys see yourself as a new church getting this done, right? Because I think in some senses we can... We could come and we can nail the gospel every week, right? We can talk to you about Jesus. We can do that all together. But the family, the connectedness, that sort of peace is, is one of the things that many of us have a heart for and that many of us aren't very good at, honestly. Like, a lot of us just aren't good at this community thing. We've never really been part of a church that had a really good community like this. So we're trying to organize things in a good way so that we can kind of try to foster this community. And so one of the things Domer mentioned earlier is, is, is we, we're trying this thing called a missional community where... We're not doing anything else programmatically as a church other than this thing called a community, a missional community. And in that, so what I mean by that is like we want everybody from different ages, young, old, to be part. We want people from different demographics, black, white, to be part and not separate them out like a lot of churches might so that it could be easier. We want to just have two things. Sunday, worship Jesus, learn about Jesus, partake and celebrate there, and have community where we exist together and life together and try to figure out how to best help one another, love Jesus, love each other, do these actions of the actual church and see God be glorified. And to see his name do some awesome things. Because here's the thing, it says right at the end here, it says you're a holy temple. And it says this, that not only are you all these illustrations, but it says in him you are also being built together into a dwelling place for his spirit. Like together, together, you're being built into a dwelling place for a spirit. That like together, you actually, God's spirit dwells in your midst, like apart, sure. But together, there's actually a force that, that, that God has for the world. And it's called his church. He uses the term body because he wants to control the thing as its head. And he wants to be a family. He wants it to be a building. And he says, in this structure, well worked out, his spirit is like blazing through you guys, in your guys. Because when I confess sin to somebody that, that's been dark for so long and I exist in community with somebody else who can pray for me, like the chains of my life sometimes just fall. I can't pull them off myself. I need somebody else to, to, to intercede for me, to help me as his family. That when I want to walk through this life serving Jesus, like I've been so prone to isolation and try to just, you know, sniper at myself. I suck at it. But when the body is together, we, we can accomplish what God has for us because his spirit, it says, dwells like a temple in our midst. 
that we've been given so much as this family, and yet we divide over things like race and gender and, and ages where we're only going to be around people just like ourselves and, and, and only to the degree that we're comfortable in isolation. And we're going to develop walls as a church. It's not complicated why the church divides, right? I mean, racially speaking. There's a lot of anger. There's a lot of, like, hatred and hostility. And there's a lot of... There's a lot of people in those churches that are dividing, like we are all tempted to, that just don't have a heart for each other. And why? Because they have lost track of the gospel that has united them to God and lost track of the gospel that unites them to each other. Because here's the deal. If we know and remember who we are, that we were divided, that we were separated, that we were cast off and we were castaways, and then we were accepted into his family, then all of the stuff that we erect to be dividing walls in our churches are going to like disintegrate. The closer we get to the truth of the gospel and remembering who we are, the closer we're going to get to actually forgetting some of these barriers that we construct, that they're actually important. Like music style. Seriously. Who gives a crap? Amen. I don't care if Brandon plays a banjo or a harmonica or a beatbox or a synth machine and he's singing songs through an auto-tuner. Like, who cares? You just sit there and worship Jesus. And if I can't, I'll just sit there and have grace on my brother who has just given it a good try. <laughs> right? And yet, and yet, the gospel not being preached, of course the balls are going to go up. Right? Of course the walls are going to go up when we're not getting close to, to who we were and to who Jesus is. We're going to just start thinking about things that we care about. Oh, you know, I, I really like older music. I like the preachers that go for 35 minutes, not 45. <laughs> churches need to look like churches. They, don't, they shouldn't look like a bar. By the way, pray for us. We got offered a bar to meet in on Sunday mornings, uh, potentially, uh, in the, on the border of Kent to Ravenna. It's going to seat 100 people. As a screen, it's a children's area for us. The guys there are um, Christians. They own the place. It'd be rent-free. Wouldn't be in a church, though, so it would feel a little different. We'd have taps over here on the right <laughs> and an open floor plan for people to come and go. But the problem is, is that some people won't like it. That if we get caught meeting in a bar as a church, man, some people are really going to have something to say, but who in their right mind erects those walls? People who have forgotten the gospel. And so may we be a people that don't forget the power of the gospel, that, that tears down walls of even my racial ugliness of my five-year-old self. And gives me African-American children later. Like, I want to see a church that actually has more than one race and type of people in it. Wouldn't that be awesome? Yeah. I want to be able to sit around a room with people younger than me and older than me, people who know more than me and people who don't. And it'd be normal. Amen. And not just have people that, that talk the same talk, walk the same walk, Speak the same theological language. Who cares? We just, I just, I want that. But I know there's stuff inside of me that fights. I want to be comfortable. I want what I want. And yet, the gospel will always call us to something deeper, so much larger, so much more beautiful than the things that we want to concoct in ourselves, the friends that we want to have, the relationships we want to develop, the people we want to hang with. The gospel has so much deeper things than that. And then we as people of his people, man, he could change us. The world has never seen the sort of unity that the church working brings. There's a peace that is way deeper than this pithy peace that the culture speaks of. It's actually people of differences existing together in love and community. Getting stuff done with Jesus, man. And it's, it's something that is a rare thing that only the gospel can actually do. So man, something I've been praying for, and some of you guys have been praying for this sort of thing for years, and we trust in faith that the God who writes scripture, who has a desire for such things, even though it doesn't exist readily in our culture, in our world, in this country, that it exists in eternity, he wants it now. <laughs> he wants it here. And so let's keep praying for it. Let's be graceful with each other and um, move from here. So I'm going to pray.